All right, you guys. So uh, welcome back to the show. Uh, I have a great guest with me today, uh, Colin from Wild Foods Company. I actually ran into uh, ran into your company probably like quite a while ago at this point, and I thought it had like the coolest packaging ever because I'm like, thank you. I spent here. a lot of your time on that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it has a lot of cool packaging, and then you also have like a lot of cool like uh, I guess photography art or whatever on your Instagram page. So so it's very cool. And uh, he's been in the industry for a while, and I wanted to talk to him today about the supplement industry, which could be just as confusing, if not more confusing than the whole food industry. I know we did a podcast yep. together on that a little while back and to kind of navigate around like all these, the myriad of different certification bodies you see on the labels of supplements, how supplements are made, which ones are good, which ones are bad, just all that, all that basic stuff. That's, that's very, very important uh, because I, I personally know, like obviously people buy supplements for health reasons, but oftentimes they're shitty quality, you know, and they do yep. anything but actually help the person. Yep. So I guess to get this conversation started, what got you into the supplement industry? How long have you been doing it for? Yeah, okay. Well, thanks for having me. And, you know, hello to everyone who's listening. Uh, I've been in this for a long time. I mean, it would re it really started back when I had a CrossFit gym. So I got, I got I caught the CrossFit bug back in, honestly, like seven years ago, eight years ago at this point. Actually, maybe it's longer than that. And it was like performance, right? You, you know, you do CrossFit, it's very performance based and nutrition is kind of a thing in the community. It's, it's like some people like get it and they go for the nutrition plus the performance. And some people are just like, well, whatever protein powder and lots and lots of calories. So I can be at the gym for four hours a day. Like you kind of have two separate, you know, uh, methodologies and, and ideologies in CrossFit. And so for me, I was like heavily into nutrition and food. And when I made that connection, I think I was introduced to the paleo diet. I think that was kind of the first concept, you know, Rob Wolf, paleo, ancestral eating. And for me, like something just clicked and I was like, whoa, um, when I eat these, you know, better foods, like when I cook scratch, buying good ingredients versus like eating sandwiches and, you know, pre-workouts and all this nonsense. And I just simplify things. Um, I perform better. I look better and I feel better. And I finally got that kind of stubborn, like 10 pounds of belly fat out of my midsection that even after training, you know, every single day, like probably overtraining, I just couldn't get that leanness I was after for years. You know, as a guy, I'm naturally leaner and I wanted kind of my abs to come out and be super lean and I just couldn't get it, you know, and finally nutrition with a kind of uh, paleo approach, you know, real food, real ingredients that got me there. And then it was like, okay, how do I optimize recovery, sleep, all these other things. And then I went down the, the supplement rabbit hole and that, you know, kind of led me to wild foods and we can kind of dig into that or whatever, but it was, you know, very much around kind of Dave Asprey's time when he was promoting bulletproof coffee. That was kind of a lot of the same timeline. And so I got into intermittent fasting. I got into doing like a butter coffee every morning, uh, skipping, skipping breakfast. And I started feeling amazing. And, you know, then just from there, I was like, okay, let me just figure out how to source uh, really good ingredients for myself, like huge bags of whey protein. And like, if I'm going to have MCT oil, let me just buy it in bulk myself, right? Because this stuff gets expensive if you're really consuming high quantities of it. And I was doing more of that then than I am now. I definitely have more of a real food approach now. But you know, when you're heavily into like something like CrossFit, it's like you know, down your protein shake, you have a pre workout, you try to you try to basically regimen everything, and it, it it got expensive. And so it was like, well, I don't know what's in these ingredients. The labels are very suspect. Like there's literally almost no information on supplement labels even to this day. You know, and so then I would look into the brands and I would kind of read like their mission statements and their about us. And there's just a huge, um, there's just a huge lack of information, even to this day. And that is really the impetus for raw foods. I started sourcing stuff for myself. I wanted to get down to the farm level. I wanted to know like for, for my protein, like, was it grass fed? How are the cows treated? Blah, blah, blah. All the different questions you can answer. And it required me to actually do a ton of research and reach out to manufacturers and farms directly and not get a response half the time, sometimes get a response and then just kind of pull in those threats. So that's kind of the origin story in a nutshell. Gotcha. Well, let's say like someone uh, is looking for a high quality supplement. Let's kind of, I guess, go down. Let's start with like the basics in terms of going down. Uh, actually, let's start with how supplements are even made. Can you break down in terms of like how the initial step of sourcing the raw ingredient and then turning it into like a, a processed powder form basically? Yeah, there's a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of process, these processes that I don't even understand, but I do, you know, through my research, figure out like, okay, what manufacturing methods are you using? And like, where's your sourcing? Because what you'll do is you'll find a lot of supplement manufacturers. You'll have the ones that are like just pure bulk. Like they want to sell as many private label products as possible where they just have stock formulas and you slap a label on it. And it's, you know, they're competing on price and convenience. And 90% of their ingredients are probably coming from China. 
right? And so for me, like, I don't necessarily have a problem with sourcing from China, but if you're just kind of sourcing from China and it's like the cheapest option, like you're not getting quality there, right? So like, mm -hmm. it just really depends on the things. And for example, like um, medicinal mushrooms, China, when you find the small growers that are doing the right way, like they're the best mushroom growers on the planet. Like you're not, it's just really hard to replicate that economically, even in the States for a lot of different reasons, right? So it really depends on the ingredient, where it's coming from. And then, you know, for me, it was, I went a little bit down the superfood route where it was like cocoa and these other kind of South American ingredients. And so wild foods is really kind of like half supplements, half like functional foods, if you know, for lack of a better term. And so for me, it was always like, let's figure out how to find organic first, like get an organic certification because I'm, a, I'm not flying to Peru or Brazil or wherever. So like at the very least, let me get that as just like a, a, a standard level. And in the beginning, I actually pr probably put more weight on it than I needed to. I figured more customers would be, would care about organic, you know? And for me, it was like the standard kind of gold seal that I could, that I could get. Um, and I paid for it, right? Like my cost of goods and, and, and my margins and everything, it was really hard to make work, you know, especially with e-commerce. And I've kind of loosened up on that a little bit because I've found manufacturers and farmers and I've dug into organic itself. And organic doesn't just necessarily mean quality. Like you can have somebody that's going beyond organic that doesn't have a label, but they do it 10 times better than organic. Mm -hmm. And then you got people that are organic that are doing mass production and they're just monocropping it and paying the certification fees. Like, you know, like it's just, it's nonsense. So, um, this kind of ties back into if we're going to talk about supplements and try to give recommendations, like what I found is it, it, it so much comes down to the brand and like who is selling, like who's in charge of the supplement brand, because they're going to be making the sourcing decisions and manufacturing decisions. They're going to be talking to the manufacturers and they're going to be, you know, getting hit up all the time. Like I could basically for our elderberry, I could maybe go with this supplier who's trying to sell me and they're half the price. But this one that I'm using right now that I really like and has qualities there do I stick to my guns and offer the double price option or do I go with this new supplier because they're doing it for half the cost? You know, like that becomes a business decision. And, and, and if you don't have a strong founder or a strong kind of brand mission, what I found mm -hmm. is it's very hard to like say no when you can almost have the same exact formula and the same exact label and pay half the price. Yeah. And so for us, it's like when, you know, with my current partner, I brought in a partner a couple of years ago to kind of scale I told them like when we were negotiating, I was like, listen, I honestly, I, I, I don't care about almost anything we do. Like you can handle the books, you can handle the finances, like whatever, but I need to control the quality of the product and have the final say. And that's like, like my one thing, you know, and they kind of were aligned and, and they kind of understood that. And so we haven't had any problems, but I, my biggest fear was they're going to come in and then basically <laughs> try to change all the formulas and, and go for like just pure cheap. And fortunately that hasn't happened because that could have been a nightmare. Right. And so Really, it's like, who's making those decisions? And do they care about the end user? Do they care about the quality? Do they care about the environment? Like, there's a lot of different variables there, and it just comes down to the people. Yeah, oftentimes to make it a little bit trickier is the companies are sold, oftentimes, you know? Yeah, and then you don't know who's making decisions yeah, after exactly. that, because now it's like a private equity guy making decisions, and like the founder's not even in the picture anymore. So it's like, I'm still in the picture. I still, I, I still, you know, have half the company, I'm the CEO and everything. So I have that, but it's like, things can definitely change in business, and you just really have to, to be able to trust who, you know, who's making those decisions. And I also put my face in the brand, right? So like Nassim Taleb talks a lot about skin in the game. And he talks about like, you want to be working with people that put their face out there, put their name out there because it's, it's a certain level of checks and balance. And it's, it's so true because I would not be able to market, let alone have a product listed on our website for sale. If it wasn't something that I was willing to use myself and give, and give my kids. And that's kind of my seal of approval. If we won't, if I don't use it and if I won't give it to my son, then I don't sell it. Gotcha. What's your take on, I've heard random opinions on this, but what's your take on like the importance of making sure you're sourcing like high quality organic raw ingredients versus the importance of processing? Like from my understanding, I mean, ideally you would want both, of course, uh, in terms of especially decreasing the overall toxic load in the supplement, you know, of random like industrial pollutants or agricultural pollutants. But if I if I had to pick one, I would moreover pick like really good processing techniques versus like uh, raw organic ingredients. You can tell me if I'm wrong. Everyone has an opinion on it. So. Yeah, I mean, there's so many variables here, but let's just take something like, like let me think about this. Maybe cocoa is a big example. Maybe uh, we can talk about fish oil. That could be a good example. Uh, these are obviously completely different processing methods and sourcing methods and whatever. But let's say we go for cocoa. The best cocoa in the world comes from Peru and Ecuador. 
right? And high, it's grown in high altitude regions, right? So it's perfect temperature. And, and basically the trees, the cocoa trees are in the wild. They're kind of like on a mountainside and you have a farm, but they're basically wild, right? If you go to a place like Africa, you have monocrops of cocoa to which they have to have massive uh, artificial inputs to be able to grow them and they grow them at scale and they do all the things that we know that monocrops are just not good for the environment. They're not good for the end product, right? And I mean, again, granted, I'm speaking in generalities here. There are some cocoa farmers in Africa that are smaller farmers, you know, like it's not just all monocrops, but mm -hmm. you do find like Hershey's might have a huge monocrop set up down there and they're trying to basically make that work by altering everything and controlling everything. Whereas cocoa in Peru is grown on a mountainside. If, you know, if the weather's bad one year, you know, prices might skyrocket because you're just not getting good cocoa from that, right? So we go with organic, fair trade, small batch. Um, basically, out of Peru, we work with a manufacturer that gets it directly from the farm. So the supply chain is like they cart it down from the mountain. They have the manufacturing right there. Then they export it, the, you know, the manufacturer and the exporter. Because a lot of times these can be different parts of the process. Like if you look into the coffee industry and all these middlemen are taking money and they're they're mixing beans and like it's just very mm -hmm. hard. So you're always mm -hmm. trying to go down to like single source, single origin and very limited supply chain. And so an example of something like that is I'm going to always, especially for a food product, I want to get uh, – as close to the, that that single origin organic, like I, you pick it off the tree and it, it goes through a very specific processing method that I, that I'm working with the manufacturer doing it, not a middleman or they, they're not outsourcing it or farming it out or whatever. And I just try to get as close with the people that are handling the product as possible. And like uh, the, the, probably the gold standard would be like a farm that grows it, that even processes it on the farm. And it can have the standards to do that. But a lot of these small farms, they don't have the machinery or everything. So you're just trying to keep a simplified supply chain, right? When it comes right. to food and ingredients and supplements, the more it moves and the more it moves between people, the less <laughs> tracking there is. And yeah. like food fraud in America for actual food is huge. Like a lot of the grains that you get from Russia and these different areas, they have massive corruption problems. So yeah. it might be organic, it might be organic imported grains, but like literally it's probably not in a lot of yeah. cases, right? So you run into problems like that. Now, the question about synthesizing ingredients this is where this is how i think about it we try to go down to the farm level and we try to, to source our processing as close to the real food whole food levels possible so like if you're pulling something out of um like if you're extracting vitamin c from from a certain uh plant or something right like again there could be so many steps in that process and it can be pushed around and moved around and synthesized in other labs and this labs and mixed and all these different things i want to kind of figure out farm level What's that ingredient? How is that being done? You know, if that can be done organic or at least good enough, then 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 that can go to manufacturing, and then they can synthesize that out, and then we have have this raw ingredient. And what you'll find in the supplement industry is you kind of have those manufacturers that can do that and like specialize in that, and and like they get like quality matters, and so they have very strict supply chains and uh, very strict auditing processes, and then you have suppliers that are like. They're just a middle. They're just basically a bulk supplier where they buy a bunch of ingredients from China. Then they send you this big list and they say, okay, pricing per pound per kilogram, and they have like 80 ingredients, right? And I, like, and then they're just trying to sell you on price, basically, mm -hmm. right? We're always trying to get. We're always trying to get sold on quality and process and, um, you know, supply chain uh, transparency, right? And honestly, like, a, a simple heuristic is. How much am I paying for my cost of goods? And so early on in this business, that's what I learned. A lot of times, because free markets do what they do, they converge on prices that tend to reflect quality. They don't always reflect quality. But a lot of times, if I'm looking at organic, you know, uh, certified fair trade uh, cocoa from Peru versus um, maybe organic certified fair trade from Ecuador, but the Ecuador is like $2 a pound or kilo, and then like the Peru is like $4. Well, I try both those samples. And even if the Ecuadorian product is good, I'm probably going to appreciate the Peru better because it's just going to be better quality. It's going to taste better. It's going to be more mild, like et cetera. And I'm going to mm -hmm. go for the $4 from Peru versus the $2 from Ecuador if there's enough of a comparison in quality that I can identify myself, right? And so like, again, for me, my methodology is quality, quality, quality. Uh, that's how you get customers. That's how you keep them. That's how you keep them happy. And that's how you prevent them from getting sick. And it's also how you 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 get them to like, you know, become lifetime users basically, right? And so I guess that answers your question in a long, in a long roundabout way. What does like the fair trade certification even mean? Oh man, don't even get me started. It's like, it's something you put there because it's kind of, it's kind of has an industry uh, like, like branding to it, but you can find examples where fair trade pricing actually pays farmers less 
than just mm-hmm. a non-fair trade certification, right? Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of things about that. There's been books written about kind of the fair trade um, like issues. Oh, it's just one of those things that, you know, consumers want simplicity. They want to look at a label and just feel mm-hmm. good about it. Like organic, yeah. feel good, right? Fair trade, feel good. The world does not operate that way. And again, it kind of comes down to the brand level. Who's selling you these products? Are they putting their face and name on the brand, the reputation on the line, right? You know, um, are you using these products and like not feeling great or getting suspect results or like inconsistency? Like there's a lot of different variables there that, you know, even just Amazon reviews, like sometimes like if you have lots of Amazon reviews and they're, they're mostly positive, like that's a sign that, you know, they're at least consistent with what they're doing, right? It's not everything because you can buy reviews or whatever, but it's becoming harder to do that nowadays. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and it just really, it so much comes down to kind of like, uh, like trusting the brand, uh, trying to get some insight into into the the process and and how they're sourcing and what they care about, what their mission is, what their statement, uh, you know, what their kind of methodology is, and then just testing also products for yourself. You know, like you can go on Amazon and buy cheap stuff, and then you can go on like maybe buy some wild foods or some other product, and you can compare them. And a lot of times, you can almost feel and taste the difference, right? So like, you, there's just a lot of variables here. It's just, I wish there was an easy. Yeah, answer to it. I figured they wouldn't be. Yeah, yeah, I learned that with the whole food industry as well. Yeah, you know, yeah, so. just chicken and organic chicken. It's not as simple, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So from my understanding, what you said is fair trade. It could mean it's fair. It could mean it's not fair. Yep. Possibly. Yep. So it's yep. and everything in between, obviously. There's a bunch of gray as well. Well, are is it like uh I didn't follow up with this in a while, but is it like legally required to have like GMP certifications now? Because I know before it wasn't. It, I mean, it might be or Good luck enforcing that. I mean, like FDA, like they got enough on their plate, right? Like mm-hmm. it's uh, it's just one of those things. Like you could literally slap a GMP stamp on a bag and then you could pack it and then you could send it to Amazon and you could sell for years before anybody pays yeah. attention or tries to audit exactly. it, yeah. you know? And so like there's also this level that I found like with my new partner who has some other businesses and they take like liability very seriously. They, they, they take auditing process very seriously and they're basically petrified of being sued. And, and like, so there are some instances where if you hit like at least medium scale um, in, with the business, like there can be some kind of quality metrics there where like with a brand new, like supplement brand, like, like they're probably just flying by the seat of their pants, to be honest, you know? So, so there is something to be said for hitting a certain amount of scale when it comes to supplements and being able to work with like the better manufacturers and the, and the larger runs and things like that. But then like, you can kind of go to a point where if you're mass producing and you're just like pumping out like millions and millions of products, you're going to run into problems because like anything mass produced in that way is almost always going to be relying on some kind of like monocropping or like mass production or whatever. And usually quality goes as, as a result. So like what I found and what I've thought about, like I would never want wild foods to be like the Centrum brand because there's probably no way we could do it and, and still have quality. So like we're almost capped at how big we can grow. We, we're, we're probably never going to be able to grow beyond like a medium sized business, mostly because of the quality issue. Do you feel like, um, let's just say, uh, as a very simple example, let's say Centrum, you have 1,000 milligrams of ascorbic acid vitamin C. And then like uh, your brand, you have 1,000 milligrams of ascorbic uh, acid vitamin C. You feel when there's like so much processing that, that uh, it's equivalent, you know, 1,000 milligrams is 1,000 milligrams or no? I, I, you know, that's, that's something that, like you said, there's a lot of different opinions here. For me, I just kind of stick with first principles. If I can source something from real food and I can keep as few steps in the process as possible, I'm always going to feel more confident uh, or at least like worry less than if I'm getting something that is mass produced, that's coming from unknown sources, that changes a bunch of hands, that has a bunch of middlemen, et cetera. And you can get absorbic acid that's pro- that's that's pulled from like, you know, cherries or other certain ingredients. And then you can get uh, vitamin C pulled from like, there's honestly things in China that I don't even know where, what they're using and they're just pulling out vitamin C and like, mm-hmm. I mean, do you want more information or less? Like, do you want more risk or less? I feel like sticking with kind of a real food approach where you at least understand where these things are are, are coming from and, and keeping that as short as possible is just going to be like better for your peace of mind. Gotcha. Do you feel like in terms of, I always question that, especially like, I know there are some legitimate processors in China, not to put them all under the same. Exactly. Rock, sure, obviously. Sure. Uh, in terms of you know, switching hands often. Is there any way to know for sure, like you're getting like the original product you ordered instead of this kind of like, they just threw in like half sugar randomly randomly in your powder of vitamin C and like, good luck deciphering that, you know? 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's what, that's where testing comes into play. And, you know, again, this is kind of that point where you kind of grow up as a business, you get like a medium to small business that uh, gets all their stuff in order. You're testing every batch and everything has to pass. So like certain COA testing or whatever, but I would say that there's a lot of ways to circumvent that and, and to work around that. And I mean, I mean, just think about the sheer volume of things that get imported into this country. Do you think the, the border patrol is like sampling raw food stuffs? Like they're usually just looking at pieces of paper and if they look good enough and they have all the information, like they just say, okay, it goes into the country. And, and so it's like, then you have the issue of, um, it, it might test that it's vitamin C and like, you might confirm that, but then there's no test of the sourcing and where it comes from. Right. And for, for wild foods, it's always like, where does it come from? How, and how was that core ingredient from nature made or grown or whatever? Like that matters a lot to the story and to the end result. And yeah, there's a lot of food fraud. Like there, people actually have no idea how much fraud there is like from sushi. Like don't order white fish at sushi restaurants. It's probably always not what they're saying it is. Hmm. Um, there's like, there's a massive amount of fraud in olive oil. There's a massive amount of fraud now in avocado oil. Uh, there's even like labeling laws. Yeah, honey, where you, right? you can say like it's olive oil and it can actually include like canola as a percentage. Like there's all this hmm. crazy stuff that goes on that some people think would be illegal and it's not. The FDA just has all these workarounds. Did you know that for peanut butter, for example, you're allowed to have like a certain parts per million of insects in the actual peanut butter because it's literally impossible to make peanut butter without insects in it. <laughs> like, but well, it doesn't have to go on the label. Content goes up then. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. It's probably better to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, sometimes you do see on labels like third party tested. Is that like mm. a certification or just something like a company can put on there and that's it? You do have to pay for those, and depending on the organization, some are more rigorous than others. Like there's certifications where you can kind of just like send your list of products and send your COAs, and they're like, oh, this looks good. Then you have some that are a little bit more where you have to actually send uh, batches, and they probably do like an audit like every three, six, or 12 months to kind of confirm. And so, for example, our whey protein, we have a third party that they they um, that, that we use to confirm. They, I think they're testing twice a year. And they take a random sample and they make sure that it has the – because it's a cold processed whey protein. And we're, we're trying to find are the immune global, globulins and the other kind of like constituents that you find in a cold processed protein. protein. And we test for that ourselves to, as part of like kind of the branding and marketing, right? That's what the manufacturer does because we also have a trademark or they have a trademark that, I, that I'm you know utilizing. It's an amazing way, but they have a trademark, Proserum Native Way. And part of that process to kind of like prove that it's high quality is to have that third party do that and they do it consistently. But it's like, you know, at the end of the day, like we could say we do that. We might do it for two years, but are we doing it every year? Like, you know, like very few people are asking these questions and, and comes down to what are you – Make sure my mic didn't go out. Can you still hear me? Yeah. Okay. okay. It'll, it'll, it, it, it honestly so much comes down to who is putting their face out there and their mm -hmm. reputation on the line. You know, like it really does because these decisions behind closed doors or when like money's tight or when you're talking to accounting or you have all these other pressures to always save money and do this and do that. Like there's a lot of opportunities. And I mean, we're selling, we're selling 40 plus SKUs. Every single one's got its own story. It's got its own supply chain issues, got its own quality issues. And it's like, we always have to stay on top of that. And I mean, we, we've simplified the business a lot for, for that, but it's just like, you re like, I'm just committed to it. Like, like that's how it was founded. That's been my purpose from the beginning. I'm very, very passionate about making sure that it's quality, making sure that, you know, we're standing by the things that I've said I'm going to do. And I keep doing what I say I'm going to do, you know, and like, it's, it's worked out, you know, we haven't grown to be massive and we probably ha have missed opportunities to do that if we kind of cut certain corners and we maybe market it in kind of those weird nefarious ways that supplements can do. But I would much rather grow a, 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 a consistent quality business, focus on quality than like a massive business where quality is like a second consideration. Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning into the podcast. I'm curious, have you ever been confused by the labels in the grocery store? In Yevgeny's book, he demystifies the difference between caged, cage-free, free-range, and pasture-raised meats. He also covers how to avoid GMOs, source high-quality water, fish, supplements, and other related topics. It's a beautifully illustrated, non-technical read that comes with a comprehensive video series and other extended learning materials. Jump on Amazon and check out the book titled Anti-Factory Farm Shopping Guide by Evgeny Trefkin. Now let's dive back into the podcast. Well, well you mentioned that, uh, you know, a lot of times 
people can slap that, for example, GMP certification label on their a supplement bottle, sell it on Amazon for months or years before they get caught and then just quickly take yep. it down, probably close their LLC, open a new one and do it all over again. Yep. Uh, yep. Such happens all time. <laughs> Is there any way, like if a person sees that and they're questioning it, that they can contact some authority body and just to confirm, like, is this company truly certified by you guys? I'm guessing they would have to contact like NSF, right? Yeah. So the G so GMP, I don't know if they have their own body, um, but you can request GMP certification from the brand itself. Okay. Right. And, and like, so we get people that ask for GM, uh, G GMP certifications, COAs on products and things like that. And generally you can, you can get those and, you know, you, you have to make sure like the, the LC name like is connected in some way. Cause even then sometimes it might be easy to like forge it or whatever. Um, you know, there's some checks and balances there. We've had some people that have reached out to like organic sort of, uh, USDA and we, they've, they've reached out to us and confirmed information and we just give it to them and it's fine. Cause like we have all our ducks in a row. Um, but there's definitely some things you can do, you know, I, you know, yeah, I don't know. It's kind of a tough one. Cause it's like, how much time do you have and how much do you want to do that? And how, I don't know what results you really get, you know? And so it, it, it is a tough one. Do you know, like uh, the difference between like C GMP versus GMP? I've seen two of those around. I'm guessing C is current good manufacturing practices and what those would entail versus just the normal GMP. I actually don't know. C, C GMP versus GMP. Let me just see. I haven't looked into it and maybe like two years yeah c c is current okay which is most recent standards technology methods so it seems like c would be better but whether or not brands even if they have it whether that whether they even have that on the label that i don't know that that's that's uh i mean honestly like when you're dealing with the better manufacturers like all of our manufacturers that we work with and, and we've set the quality and we like really have an agreement on like what we're doing and everything they're super paranoid about about lawsuits and about quality issues. I mean, cause we're, we're dealing with, so, we're dealing with things that people put in their body, mm -hmm. right? Like there's risks there. And, and, you know, again, it comes down to, do you trust the company? Do you trust, the brand? you know, really, it really so much comes down to that. It's, it's crazy. Yeah. That's where I learned about the whole food industry as well. That too. Know? Exactly. Whole like, food. Brand, like, I don't you trust care if farm. I that USDA organic certification. Yeah, exactly. Non -GMO yep. cert I just have to be there and see it to really know I'm getting like what I exactly want out of that product. Yep. That's unfortunately it's come down to that, but. I, I see it's copy and paste model in the supplement industry as well, but I guess yep. in the supplement industry, it's concentrated, you know, so you have to be extra, extra, uh, extra careful. Uh, well, also like from last time I checked, it seems like GMP, even the GMP certification, all they require is just like a paper trail. But then again, well, yeah, but the main, like, the, so the like, facilities themselves usually have some kind of auditing or inspection process. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, I don't know how in depth that goes. I mean, GMP has been come something that they just like, yeah, it's probably become a little farmed out or, or like, or like, um, mass standardized just because there's so many people doing things. Uh, but like when you're dealing with the manufacturers, which there's not a ton of supplement manufacturers, I mean, like to start one, to start a supplement manufacturing company, like you need machinery and you need auditing and you need mm -hmm. FDA stuff. You need all these different things. So like I, I would assume that most of the, the, the manufacturers are going to have probably like at least a, a yearly or a twice a year audit or something like that. So, yeah, yeah I, I think mean, last time I spoke with uh, Sean uh, Torbati from. Um, shoot, he's going to probably hate me that I forgot his supplement brand name, uh, but whatever. Uh, he, he mentioned, that I think they do like three uh, audits once every three months where they come in and just kind of briefly look around. And then once a year, they do like an in-depth, like seeing details of your paperwork, yep. all that stuff. Uh, I don't know if that's changed. I had a conversation with them about like two years about uh, two years ago. The bigger the bigger manufacturers are doing that. Like, yeah, like if you're buying from like kind of a small, like a, like a medium-ish business um, or even like kind of towards a small end, um, you're likely sourcing from manufacturers that have regular audits because they're doing a lot of volume you know they might be doing other brands or whatever and they have your stuff that they run every so often um and they're yeah they're pretty pretty uh those companies are pretty strict with their their process gotcha generally well in yeah. terms of organic ingredients do you do you need to see that usda organic stamp on the product or what does a customer need to look for to so this is are. actually yeah this is a, a funny thing because for years we were selling organic ingredients but because it went from we would get bulk organic and we would do a small run with a co-packer but the co-packer wasn't certified organic we actually couldn't 
put certified organic on the product, you need like another step to where like they get certified organic and then like they're approved. Mm -hmm. And so like, it might go through like four people um, in, in different steps of like manufacturing, like bulk supplier, then, then co-packer, then whatever. And they each have to be certified mm -hmm. organic to be able to pack, kind of pass that on. Um, there was a workaround we found where if we would go to like the bulk supplier that was certified organic and we would say, okay, now we need you to co-pack our stuff. And, and some of them were able to do that. So then we would actually just get a finished product from them and, and the finished product could be organic because it didn't leave the facility and go anywhere else, right? But for years, we were selling certified organic products, but we couldn't put the label on even though the, the material was exactly the same. And all mm -hmm. we did was like take it from a, a pallet and get it into single serve bags, right? So, you know, there there is a good level of checks and balances there for the most part. But like you just can't look at organic and, and say it's a catch-all because like you can have bad organic and you can have good organic and you can have non-organic that's even better than organic. Yeah, and also once again, the processing comes into play. I don't know if cleanlabelproject.org is doing like audits of random companies anymore, but I remember I'm not going to mention anyone, any company here, but they can uh, the listener can go on that website themselves and see their very popular brands with like USDA organic all over it, uh, third party tested, uh, non GMO label on there, and a myriad of, a myriad of other certifications, and then you see their score. Uh, mm -hmm. their toxicology score and they're like their processing sucks because yep. they still have like a high toxic load heavy metals are through the roof yeah uh, other contaminants are there sometimes the the protein quantity is like one number they say on the label is completely different number when they do the third party yep. testing and yep. so yeah i mean uh i was kind of i was buying one of those brands that's why i'm bitter towards it. but uh, because i'm like oh man with all these labels on here it must be legit you know and it's in every expensive uh you know, organic store. And I'm like, okay, well, uh, well, so here it goes back to your, comment. your statement that you really have to know who you're dealing with, you know? Yeah. And here's a, here's actually a good comment to uh, consider with that. So retail as a business, like for example, Whole Foods, Walmart, whatever is notorious for being ruthless, cutthroat and very, very thin margins. Right. So like just to sell at Whole Foods, you have to get a third party distributor. So Unify is a big one. And there's some other ones. And then they take a percentage of your sales. Then mm -hmm. they transport the product to Whole Foods, basically all they do. And then Whole Foods needs you to be within a certain margin threshold and they need a certain markup and you have to compete against other products. And like, it's really brutal. And so if you're going as just a straight supplement play, you're not, you don't have a lot of room for margin, which, you know, profit, which between cost of goods and, and, and what you make. And you have literally two to three people um, that might be cutting into your margin even then. And so it's like, when you get to that point where you're servicing like every Walmart, for example, or every Whole Foods, for example, whatever, and you're going to that scale, there's almost a point where some products, because the market, like for vitamin C, for example, $10 a bottle or whatever, like whatever the average just like vitamin C might be on a retail shelf, because that's kind of your entry point for competition. Because if your bottle's $20 and, and, and it's quality, but 10 is kind of what the going rate is. A place like Whole Foods is like, well, it's just vitamin C. We're not going to sell a $20 bottle. You got a 10 bottle right there and shelf space is valuable. So mm -hmm. you actually can't even enter the game because your, your price is too high. So then the question is, well, do we just, you know, it's the old, if I can't beat them, join them. Do we join them and buy the vitamin C that's cheap from, from China or whatever so that we can do it in mass production where you get a lot of the more heavy metals and less, tr less whatever, and just lower quality. There's a really big problem with, uh, with retail in that way where it tends to kind of keep the quality of the ingredients low because price and margin is such a thing and it's so hard and you know like with e-commerce there are issues uh with with shipping and like there are certain logistic things but you you usually aren't paying a middleman and you don't have to like go down to wholesale and then do this so like you generally have more room for margin and that's really i think the only way wild foods could even exist like if i would have done this 20 years ago with, with amazon that didn't exist and e-commerce didn't exist and i would have had to go for like a pure e uh retail play there's no way that i could have made it economically feasible mm -hmm. and, and even be able to have a little bit of margin right even a little bit of margin on e-commerce basically means no margin in retail so that's mm -hmm. just something to keep in mind yeah so i tend yeah. to actually nowadays like the new the new age of supplements is find those really good brands that are doing direct direct consumer you know or at least on amazon and you're going to be able to find better quality than a lot of times you find on a retail shelf in, in a traditional right. store I would, that's from my observation I would, I would agree seeing that as well i also found with like beef products for example a lot of these uh uh you know like third-party distributors like regen they market themselves as regenerative farms and you have like a lot of social media personalities promoting these companies uh and you find out they're buying their beef uh for like 
grass fed beef for like five dollars a pound for their ground beef. Oh, they're, they're buying from someone else. I'm like, resell okay, it. <laughs> that's extremely yeah. questionable right there. Automatically, yeah. you can't even produce basically beef in the U, like quality grass fed beef in the U.S. for five dollars a pound. You know. So anyways, yeah, to make your point, I totally see that. Direct to the farm though. In that example, you go direct to the farm. Like maybe some of these better farms that are doing it, like there's Alder Spring Ranch is, is a small family farm that I source from. I've had uh, the owner on the podcast and like they literally do everything. They process it on the farm. They raise it in the wild on the farm. Um, uh, white oak pastures, I haven't tried them myself. I've seen some good things. You know, they've done like some research, some studies or whatever. And some people have kind of criticized or whatever. But I mean, at the end of the day, like if you can – Go like you can go there, right? And you can mm -hmm. kind of probably see how they do a lot of things, so that mm -hmm. like, you can learn for yourself that way, right? But it's it's just like anything. Like when we can cut out a lot of the middleman in a lot of these industries, you can have more room for more investment into the quality of the product. And when it comes mm -hmm. to food and supplements and anything, you want as much money spent as possible on the farm at the farm growing level because that means it's going to be a better product, right? You want to continually give farmers ability to reinvest in technology and a better crop and not have to like be, uh, you know, at the mercy of like a middleman that basically says, oh, well, you're getting $2 a pound for this coffee. And that's just is what it is. Deal with it, right? Like there's a yeah. lot of this stuff that goes on in fair trade and uh, even just like the coffee import export business. Uh, cocoa happens a little bit too, but coffee is like notorious for it, mm -hmm. right? And it's like, it, but, but there's now farms that have leveraged the internet and you can buy directly from that farm and they'll ship it like literally from Peru or from Colombia or whatever. And you don't have any of those other issues. And so that farmer, as a result, creates their own income stream that they control. They can invest more into the product and then they can, they can make the connection to like to, wow, if I make a better product, people will keep coming back and I'll probably be able to attract more people through word of mouth so let me just keep investing in my product versus the other model which is well this coffee is going to go on a retail shelf mm -hmm. and all the prices are fixed and i have no wiggle room i need to just mm -hmm. pump it out as cheap as possible gotcha well what, what's your what's your take on another popular um certification you see on labels of the non-gmo certified how, how credible is that one would you say i would say because of some of the politics around it lately it is pretty credible um like organic though is also non-gmo yeah. Mm -hmm. And now they have like a non-GMO that's like third party. So like, yeah, if you get that and you have the organic, that's kind of a double, a double whammy. Um, I assume they're separate bodies. I don't even know if there's maybe a way to like look at the organic and if the organic says that you get this one, I, I don't, I haven't looked into that totally. Um, but what I found is like for us, for example, we don't need to have a, a non-GMO label generally because we're sourcing organic, but all in every instance we can sourcing from small farms that are like really focused on quality and you just can't do GMO that way. GMO is like a, a monocrop setup usually, you know? Mm -hmm. And so um, I hope that GMO doesn't like start getting down to the small farm level. Like I, I, I mean, I guess that could happen. I'd have to think about that. Um, but just, you know, combination of, of organic certified and trusting who we're currently working with, we haven't seen it to be an issue, you know? Yeah. And for the listener, you got to be careful with sneaky, GMOs and supplements too, like a lot of vitamin C is actually sourced from GMO corn. It says ascorbic acid, and once you read into it a, a little bit- A lot of more, things like, are made from corn nowadays, right? Yeah, GMO corn too. Although they have like a picture of like an orange on the label, you know, the yep. average consumer is like, oh, this is just orange concentrate, you know? No, it's actually yep. GMO yep. corn concentrate. So yep. you got to be careful and uh, uh, when you're buying that stuff, especially if you're buying those supplements for your kids that have like a not as strong of a metabolism as a large grown adult, you got to factor that in. How about, you know, one I haven't seen for a while that I really liked before is the banned substance control group. Have you seen that certification? Mm -hmm. I saw it from time to time, occasionally like a while back, but then I literally haven't seen them. I don't even know if they're around anymore. BSCG, let me see. They're kind, yeah, of, like they're black, around. They're kind of like a black and gold label, right? Yeah. It is black and gold. So yeah, this is definitely, they're targeted to athletes more so. Um, I, you know what? I bet you'll, you'll see this on certain pre-workouts. That's probably okay. the most obvious use case because athletes will use pre-workouts or whatever. Like, I, you know, you're probably not going to see something like this on like a whey protein just because there's nothing really in whey that's going to do that. But but some of the pre-workout stuff and the crap they try to put in there might show up in a test and that might be a consideration. So, yeah, I mean generally, you, you know, the more certifications, the better. Like just the more people kind of paying attention to the product, the better, I, I would say. Um okay. But it, yeah, just you got to trust. You, you still got to trust who you're, who you're buying from. And kind of that's what, what it comes down to. Do you know if anyone in the supplement industry is doing like the biodynamic ingredients certification? I haven't literally seen that on any supplements at all. I've been hearing 
some some talks about it and the you know like the 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 regenerative agriculture kind of like um i think there's different certifications or they're trying to create some i think that'll be great um i just hope it doesn't become like the next organic <laughs> where yeah, it's watered down after a basically point. like right you take like after a certain point it's like well here's kind of the loopholes and then you can say you're regenerative and you're really not you yeah. know so like i hope it's like an independent like 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 so here's a good example if the founder of that label, like the label that becomes popular, is like me, and they're ruthless with quality, and they're doing this because it's like a mission, it's a purpose, it's it, it's 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 impactful, and their face is on the brand, mm -hmm. then it's 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 more likely that that won't become like the next organic, which at this point is just like a government body, right? Right. So it comes down to trust. It still comes down to trust. You know, like that label would then be like, well, who's making the decisions for that label or in our company, and that's going to pretty much determine the level of trust that I can, I, I can put into this, this certification. Gotcha. What's your, you know, I've been kind of studying amyloid buildups and uh, I think we talked about this on the podcast together in factory farmed uh, animals in particular in their organs, like the liver mm -hmm. and spleen and also to their, the muscle tissue to a smaller extent. What's your take on organ supplements? Because that's kind of a little bit worrisome to me when I see like organ supplements being sold, because I'm like, man, you're getting, unless their processing is really on point, uh, and, I, and I actually contacted a few of these companies asking about amyloids. They didn't even know what amyloids were, you know, which is a little bit, a little bit troubling to me. So that's, what's your take on that? Have you done any research? I've only done a little bit of research in terms of organ supplements. I've done more research yeah. on the amyloid sides of that, but. Yeah. Yeah. So when it comes to organ supplements, I have, a, I have very limited insight into how the industry works, how it's done. I mean, there's like only a few players even doing it. Mm -hmm. um, I think. Anything like that's going to be a concern. Um, I also just think generally organs are more like as a food, they're more as a supplement to the, the, the human diet anyways. Like, you know, if you take down a, a bison, let's just think ancestrally for a moment, and you have like one liver, you have one this, you have one that, whatever. And, you know, a lot of uh, hunter-gatherer tribes actually would have saved those foods for mothers or those pregnant because they considered them kind of maternity foods. And so it's like how often – like if that was a thing – how often would the 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 men even been eating them, right? Or mm -hmm. maybe they have a little bit or whatever. Um, there's even examples of the Inuit kind of tossing them to the dogs because they just didn't really like them. Like, and you have different accounts of this. I just think that you, when it comes to supplements, I mean, I don't know. It, it's it is interesting. Like, I would rather just eat the eat the real thing and like eat it every so often as kind of like an addition to my diet. You know, that that's kind of how I think about it. And and I guess there could be value in the supplements. But I don't believe that the natural use case for an animal organ for the human animal is to be taken every day. So I would say even if you are taking organ supplements, you should take it like – you should mix it up, cycle it, like be very inconsistent with it to try to replicate what it would have been like in nature. And that's I think more likely to make you anti-fragile versus fragile and you, like maybe the amyloid thing or whatever, the other issues like that. You're just going to be less susceptible to them. right? But I don't think you should be popping liver – every single day like it's just that's not essentially accurate right gotcha gotcha okay well um what what's your what's your oh yeah quick uh i had a question about this and so this one kind of like always changes opinions depending on who you ask what's your take on like sourcing high quality like uh fish oil supplements i know that one's like become really tough as well uh in terms of like even just getting like one that's not rancid just asking something basic like that uh can you kind of go into some so what you know about that aspect? Yes. So let's see. When you're when you're getting fish oil from overfish populations of fish, you're destroying the environment, and you're 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 typically going to run into rancid uh, rancidity issues. Um, typically, these are mackerel, uh, anchovies, and I think there's like there's one other one that you'll see in the label like it's a source from three fish. These are generally generally caught off the coast pollock. of Spain and or South America. Yeah. What, which is it? Pollock like a popular one. Pollock? Pollock might be one. Yeah. 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 So those kind of Spain, off the coast of Spain and or South America, those are traditionally the overfished and mass produced fish oils that you're going to find like when you go to Walmart and you see a little capsule. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then you have cod liver. I love cod liver. I think cod liver is a freaking superfood. Uh, I, I eat cod liver in a, in cans like that. I also take cod liver oil. We don't actually offer it because it's, it's just like there's – like Carlson's has a good brand and mm -hmm. there's a couple other brands that, that have been doing it for years. They, they just do it well and they you know they have pretty rigid quality standards and I haven't taken them and I never have any issues. And so I take cod liver a lot, right? Then the other way to do it, if we're talking about fish oil, 
And I know this definitely sounds like an ad, but we at Wild Foods, we have a Friends of the Sea certified fish oil that is, is, is very unique, that it's one of the only fish oils that also includes DPA, which is a new omega-3 that they've been doing some research on that they're thinking might be more beneficial for anti-inflammatory, uh, you know, anti-inflammatory benefits than DPA and uh, DHA, right? Or, EP, or EPA and DHA. And so this is from a very specific fish off the coast of Virginia. So Reedsville, Virginia, where the manufacturer that, that we work closely with, they actually own the fishing boats. They also own the processing. They own every step of the supply chain, completely vertically integrated from when they go out and how often they're even fishing these small fish called menhaden, which are small fatty fish that replenish. And they have it in a way where these planes go out and they can track the schools and they only fish a certain amount so that the schools, because they were, they're small fatty fish, they replenish so fast that they're doing it in a sustainable way. And these are wild caught, uh, like sustainable not disrupting ecosystem, right? Small fatty fish. So the smaller the fish, the less likely you have for he heavy metal issues because larger fish like swordfish and shark mm -hmm. over years ac accumulate heavy metals. And then they bring that back and they control every part of the process from encapsulation to bottling to the, the processing at like the dock level, like everything is controlled. And it is one of my favorite products that we've been able to offer. One of the ones I'm, I'm the most proud of and something that I take regularly and I like, I give it to my son. He, he'll take like a teaspoon of it, of, of the liquid. And so that compared to the overfish mass produced stuff that you can basically get again, like very much like that list of that you'll get from like a China supplier. They'll just be like, they'll have 80 supplement supplements or ingredients on a list. They'll have a price per kilogram and you'll always see fish oil or omega three on there somewhere. And that's almost always from the lower quality mass produced stuff that again has maybe changed five hands or six hands or whatever, or maybe sitting in a warehouse over here, or how is it shipped on this cargo ship? How often, how long did it sit in the port in the dead heat? Like there's so many issues with fish oil because it is a highly sensitive polyunsaturated fatty acid that is easily oxidized. You don't want to, to mess with lighter heat when it comes to that. You don't want to mess with your processing when it comes to that, right? So by being able to control the entire supply chain, and, and testing multiple times, and then we use a cold process technique, and it's a triglyceride form. It's just great stuff, and I'm super excited about it and passionate about it, and like it's amazing. I would recommend everybody though, if you can't afford like afford it, even though you know that's I think that's subjective, but don't buy the cheap stuff. Like you're better off not taking cheap fish oil than taking cheap fish oil. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, quick question: like with the cod fish oil, that always comes from a wild source, right? I don't know any cod. Cod, cod too. I've never seen a farmed uh, okay. source and like they have like a massive cod operation and like I think it's like New Zealand or like some of those Scandinavian areas over there where they just been doing it for so many years and they, they have it dialed in and you know some of them may own the fishing boats or not I don't know but it's a pretty specific supply chain and the bigger brands like Carlson for example that I buy from they do test regularly and mm -hmm. so like you know there's 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 a lot there and I've, I've also just found that I take the product regularly I always feel great. I've never had an issue. I, I don't get fish burps or anything like that that might suggest like um, a rancid product. Like so, again, you're you're always kind of testing and paying attention to the things you're buying because quality could change. You know, maybe Carlson becomes too big and they want to hit Walmart, and then mm -hmm. the quality goes down or whatever, right? So it, again, you got to trust the brand. Gotcha. Well, I guess my last question, unless you have uh, other things to add, are you familiar with like peptide supplements? I've been, you know, I've been hearing about peptides lately. Mostly because I have some friends that are into psychedelics and like frog, frog poison where you can get peptides. Um, but I, I, I honestly, it's completely new to me, you know? That's right. Well, yeah. but I do notice I, one thing I'm kind of trying to experiment with more myself is taking like mushroom supplements. And mm -hmm. I noticed everyone yep. sells a decent amount of them. Can you kind of go into a general outline of uh, what a person should know in that area and uh, what kind of mushroom supplements are out there, et cetera? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. There's, um, there's a lot. <laughs> this is a, this this is a big topic. The quality is all over the place. There's there's been a lot of int um, new entrance into the market since Four Sigmatic kind of made it popular. Um, we still source our mushrooms directly from China. Small farmers, uh, they have these kind of like eco greenhouses that they grow them in a very certain way. A lot of them are multi generational farmers, and then they you know ideally at the farm level they can also do the processing, which is kind of like when it comes to mushrooms. It, think of like a really big broth. 
and you're going to you're going to kind of cook it down, get that liquid, and then you're going to have that that liquid spray dried into a powder, and then that's the powder you consume. And so, for example, if you have a typical mushroom supplement, will be like a ten to one. It'll say ten to one. That means that for every ten pounds of mushrooms that they've grown, they've they pulled out one pound of dried powder, so it's a concentrated form, and you have like the beta glucans and the the some of the other compounds in there. And the way to think about medicinal mushrooms is they're known as an adaptogen. Okay, so what that means is that actually I just want to make sure my screen's frozen. Are you still there? Yep. Can you still see me? Okay, there, there, it's back, kick back. Okay. So when it comes to medicinal mushrooms, they're adaptogens. Okay, so an adaptogen is something that that is not supposed to give you an energy boost or anything like that. It's supposed to kind of come in and help your body better adapt to stress. So I always think about it as it comes in and just helps me perform better, uh, helps me recover faster, and just kind of operate better. And yeah, there's a lot of mileage difference in, in different brands and different products because there's so much variation in how they're grown, how they're processed. Um, generally, you want to look for is uh, like, if, I mean, even organic is tough because like a lot of the Chinese stuff that is like really high, very potent, it's not organic. And then a lot of the organic stuff is like a single extract when you really mm -hmm. want like a triple or a quad extract. Um, and then you can also have a water extract and an alcohol extract, which some say is better because you get different compounds on each. Uh, we have a, we have two that that are a dual extract, and then we have the rest that are uh, a hot water extract. So it's a three times extract, and it, like cordyceps is different than than reishi than than chaga. They're all kind of unique in their own way. It's a really fun thing to kind of explore and test. And if you find a quality source that you like, you know. Your morning coffee, or if you do a smoothie, or if you do like a butter coffee, or or a pro or workout, a pre workout or post workout, whatever, just like throw a little bit of mushroom in there and get a little bit of a boost. And like if you've never taken anything like that, some people will feel kind of different effects as they first get on it. And then as it goes with everything, like you want to maybe cycle it every so often. Uh, and yeah, medicinal mushrooms are a really cool thing to explore. I would recommend people kind of just learn the basics of, of the top mushrooms uh, and just experiment with how they might incorporate. Or incorporate those into their diet. There, it's definitely a fun thing to explore. Gotcha. Well, thanks for thanks for being a guest on on the show, Colin. It's really good to connect with you. Do you have like any closing statements that you want to add, or any topics you would like to cover? I mean, uh, as far as supplements goes, well, okay, yes, I do. I do have one thing to say. So, if you don't have your nutrition dialed in, and you're not already eating a real food basically scratch prepared, not eating at restaurants, ideally not, not even sourcing most of your food from like traditional grocery stores like you and I talked about. If you don't have that down, don't spend money on supplements. Mm -hmm. Like honestly, just don't even worry about it. And I, and I would say if you had to pick one or two supplements to start with, I would definitely aim for uh, the wild fish oil, the cod liver oil, and like maybe a magnesium, a high quality magnesium that has multiple magnesiums because a lot of people are deficient in magnesium. And there's a lot of different brands you'll have to kind of compare. And like I've tested a few brands, some I like better than others, some I think are overpriced more than others. But as, as it goes with everything, just kind of test and figure out what works for you. And I would say just like focus on those few core supplements um, and focus on your diet. Like stop eating at restaurants, stop eating out of a package, cut the sugar and the refined grains and the processed food out of your diet. And then when you want to optimize for either performance or specific like goals, fitness goals and or longevity, then you can experiment with different supplements. Because here's the thing, when most people that are eating a standard American diet or anything even remotely close to it, they pop up a supplement and they don't feel anything because their body is already so like inflamed and in disrepair that this something kind of goes in and like it just can't do anything it can't really operate or you don't notice it because your body's doing all these other things so it's like imagine throwing supplements into a body that is inflamed and it and, and just like for a, a a visual heuristic just imagine that supplement just gets burned up nothing happens that's not that's not how it works but i'm saying like imagine that like you're just throwing money down your mouth for no reason right it does nothing right that's how i would visualize it and then make your focus your diet and i tell people this all the time Wild Foods, we're here to offer really good supplements and foods to help you maintain a consistent lifestyle based on a real food eating plan. And if you don't have that real food eating plan down, then you don't you don't need our products, right? And you should wait and you should bring them in later. Gotcha. All right, Colin. Well, I appreciate it, man. If anyone wants to get a hold of Colin, I'm going to have all his info in the description section. So feel free to shoot him an email or a message on Instagram. And stuff. Yep. This has been fun. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, man. It's great to see you again. You too. Hi everyone, thanks for tuning into the podcast. 
I'm curious, have you ever been confused by the labels in the grocery store? In Yevgeny's book, he demystifies the difference between caged, cage-free, free-range, and pasture-raised meats. He also covers how to avoid GMOs, source high-quality water, fish, supplements, and other related topics. It's a beautifully illustrated, non-technical read that comes with a comprehensive video series and other extended learning materials. Jump on Amazon and check out the book titled Anti-Factory Farm Shopping Guide by Evgeny Trefkin.